People are always talking about it. You read about it in the papers. You see it on YouTube. But seeing this joint hold up first person, just blowing my mind. Finally broke down and got some proper silicon bronze brazing wire. Sometimes called SIB for short. Okay, nobody calls it SIB, but wouldn't that be a cool name? It's mostly bronze, which in itself is mostly copper. All with a dash of silicon and some other junk. Not to be confused with silicone bronze, which is different. Pound for pound, this stuff costs more than a good steak. And to me anyway, only tastes about half as good. I got it in 332nd size. I already cut the three foot lengths down in half, so it feels like I bought more of them. But I'm getting ahead of myself. TIG brazing is a way of joining metals without technically welding them. In theory, you never melt the base metal, so it's not welding. That potentially has two advantages. First, it doesn't involve as much heat as welding does. Well, that's just dandy, old Tony, but who cares? I'll tell you who cares. This crazy thin piece of steel might. Maybe it wants to be soulmates with this thicker piece. You certainly could weld this, but it can get tricky. The thicker part is going to want a lot of heat. And by the time you get to fusion temperature, well, the thin part may have gotten away from you, gotten way too hot and completely burnt through. You don't usually see it on the fabrication drawings. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's sort of implied. Giant melty holes aren't a good thing. And since the melting temperature of the silicon bronze is much lower than the parent material, well, in theory, it should be easier to weld thin to thick. I guess that's pretty cool, but is that all? But that's not all. Because we're not melting the base metals, we're not messing with the chemistry of the joint. I mean, as long as the copper can bond to it, you can join materials that normally don't like being in the same room together. I mean, how many times have we all tried to weld cast iron to tool steel only to have it crack after cooling? With copper as the marriage counselor, you can get them to play along. Stainless steel to steel, no problem. Copper to steel, not a problem. Mahogany to cherry, that's a problem. But just like marriage counseling, there are some compromises if it's going to work. Silicon bronze is now what's holding the parts together, like hot glue. The strength of the metal isn't technically as strong. Not by much, but it's not as strong. Sib clocks in at around 50 or 60 KSI. Steel filler is probably going to start at 70 KSI and go up from there. Now notice I said the strength of the metal, not the strength of the joint. The joint could be as strong or stronger. Since the filler is of lower strength, you'd need a properly designed joint to account for that. Before we don our gay apparel, let's talk about the setup a minute. I get a lot of questions when I just glance over details like that. Today my welder is wearing a CK air-cooled torch, complemented by a lovely number no. 7 pink cup that really brings out its eyes. This torch is the FL125, the smaller one with the funny kinked neck, the flex lock. It's called a flex lock torch, and just a regular cup, no fancy gas lens. 332nd lanthanated tungsten, though I doubt that's going to matter much. I won't be using the foot controller. I've got the button attached, being sure to use only genuine TIG torch rubber bands, of course. Two reasons I'm opting for this setup. First, I want to get a good feel for what the amperage setting should be, and just how sensitive this filler is on small eighth inch plate to small changes in that amp setting. Were I sporting a foot controller, all of those adjustments to some extent would be subconscious as I watch the weld and, I don't know, probably be constantly making updates with my foot. Reason number two, the machine was already set up with this torch from the last time, and I'm not really in the mood to swap it out. I'll be brazing these small pieces of hot rolled steel. This will need a good cleaning, of course, with a flap disc, which I'm not looking forward to. Helmet is a 3M speed glass. Sorry about that, that looked a little gross. I should have cleaned it beforehand. No matter what hood you use, keeping it clean is nice. Being able to see through it really goes a long way. It's got this three piece bay style window. Got a light behind it, hopefully that makes it easier to see. Only the middle lens auto darkens, of course. The side ones just give a bit more visibility. Give you some peripheral vision. You know, maybe you can see if your cat's on fire when it's not supposed to be. Not a must have, but certainly airier in there. If you're just getting into TIG welding or any welding and don't own an auto darkening helmet, I highly recommend one. They can get a bit expensive, but you certainly don't need to buy the most glamorous one. And if it turns out you don't like welding, well, you can always wear it to the beach. And finally, or firstly, do you hear that? 
That sound you're not hearing is my welder. Lots of you have been asking how it's settling in and to date, no complaints, it's been great. We'll be brazing on DC, standard stuff, electrode negative, pretty low amps probably. I think you can do this in AC, brazing I mean, but this is my first time so I'm gonna try to keep things simple. Okay, I think I'm ready to give this a try. I've got the parts super clean, well pretty clean. Okay, fine, all I did was knock off the scale. We wanna get things hot enough to be able to melt the bronze filler but not so hot that we're melting the base metal. We're using the TIG torch just for the heat and the shielding gas. The brazing rod itself has no flux and I'm not gonna be adding any. Let's start off with, I have no idea. Eighth inch material, just enough to get it dull red without forming a puddle. Let's try 20. 20 is way not enough. Let's try 40. Forty still isn't enough. I mean, it's a cold weld. Let's try fifty. Still not enough. Sixty. I think that's starting to get there. With thinner filler, that might actually work. But I'm going to push it to seventy. Seems like we're starting to get someplace with 70. I'm gonna let this cool down and do the other side or prep two more pieces of steel. I added quite a bit of heat by the time I got to the middle, so I'm not sure if that's really 70 or not. I'm gonna try this again at 75, maybe 80 on some cold steel. Now, I think you can tell that it started off very cold. Starts to look good maybe in the middle in terms of, you know, fill, leg size of that fillet. Here it looks nice, it was flowing a little consistent, but it looks a little too concave. Two new pieces of steel, these are cold, room temperature. Try it at 75 amps. <laughs> 75 amps, starting off on cold coupons, seem to go pretty good. Though there's just a touch of weirdness going on. It's happening almost automatically, but I notice that I'm washing the bead between the two parts. So I'm adding filler, it's not quite wetting out on its own. I use the arc to pull it down a bit, shape it, sounds a little dramatic. But I find myself waiting and working a bit for the one bead to fully develop before I move on. I wanna try this again at 80 amps. There's also some junk on there. Looks like some kind of copper oxidation. I'm gonna take just a little more care in cleaning the parts. I'm also scotch brighting the silicon bronze filler and giving everything a wipe down with some acetone. Let's see what happens with clean stuff and 80 amps. Okay, that did come out a lot cleaner. Bear with me just a moment. I wanna try this again, but this time without the camera all up in my stuff. It's always tricky to get those shots. I'm always worried my helmet's gonna hit the lens or my hand's gonna obstruct something. I just wanna try it with my natural range of motion. I should've just stopped while I was ahead with the camera excuse. Okay, that's the one I just did and wire brushed and that was the one from before. Same settings. Although things seem to be running a lot better at 80 amps, I keep hesitating on some of the beads. You can see them there, there, I guess there, probably that one too. I wanna almost go hotter. If I'm not careful, I am starting to melt the base metal. When I move ahead, I can see it start to puddle before I kinda of put that fire out with the silicon bronze. I don't think that's a legit move. But the way the bronze is behaving, I almost wanna push it up a few more amps. I don't wanna melt the base metal, but I want more heat to melt the filler rod, which is completely like bizarro world TIG welding. Against every rule in the rule book, against every fiber of my being, and my being is at least like 400 thread count. I can almost guarantee, had I been doing this with the foot pedal, I almost certainly would have been pulsing this. Probably giving the filler a hotter shot and then dropping back to tie it in with the rest of the bead. You know, now that I say that out loud, I wonder if I'm using too large of a filler rod. But maybe we try this with the built-in pulser in the HTP. Before I do that though, I'd like to try to break these. Break these joints, just see how they're doing. That and blow off some of this pent up rage. 
I'm going to try to break this first one towards myself. I think that should be the weaker direction. I expect to crack that bead through the bronze. This one, I'm going to try to bend backwards. That was the same settings, about the same bead size, but that's still pretty impressive. For kicks, let's try this with pulse. And do you need pulse to do this? Certainly not. Although mine aren't the prettiest welds in the world, they do seem sound. And since the HTP has a built-in pulser, well, maybe I can use that to make up for my lack of practice. Now, for the sake of time, I've already run two test pieces trying to get the pulse settings in. Because of the amperage tests we did up until now, finding the settings I like hasn't taken very long at all. In fact, I'd like to make one last tweak and try this once more. Big picture, what I'm trying to do is balance the heat so I get a more consistent looking bead. Note, I didn't say just consistent. I said more consistent. More of that stacked look. I want to mimic what I would do with a foot controller. Give the filler a shot to melt it. It ties in, then cools off into a consistent ripple, and move on to the next. You certainly don't want to hit it so hard and so fast that all you're doing is melting the bronze onto the base metal. You don't want to trade off a good looking bead for no tie-in or no mechanical strength. Anyway, let's look at the machine settings. That last weld you saw was at 110 amps. I'm going to add just a little more, 115 amps. Pulse frequency is 0.5. Maybe a little slow, but that's one cycle every two seconds. Pulse duration is 40%. That means I get those 115 amps for 40% of that two second cycle. The remainder, or the background current, is 60% of my amp settings. 60% of 115, that's almost 66. Oh, it's called 70 amps. So the welder is alternating between 115 and 70 amps. The net effect is a weld heat of about 75 amps, give or take, which seems about right. Although it couldn't hurt, you don't need a degree in advanced experimental mathematics like I have to set up a pulsar. A pulsar, on the other hand, just fiddle with it, try it out. Think about what you want the heat to do, how hot and how long you want it on for, then how cold you want it to drop to. Finally, figure out the pulse rate you can keep up with without killing yourself or getting a migraine. The difference between machine pulsing and manual pulsing with an amp controller, like all robot overlords, the machine will show no mercy. Once you hit go, it's gonna force feed the torch with an exquisitely timed pulse train, and now the onus is on us to keep up. So you know, no pressure there. With a foot control, if you need to hang out for another split second, you can. Maybe you advanced too far and need a smidge more heat. Or you're frantically running out of filler and you need just one more god second to keep up. Well, you can let off a bit. With the built-in pulser, you can't do that. How well you maintain that balancing act, to some extent, dictates how your weld looks, which should explain what you've been seeing me do so far. Hold the boat and or phone. I'm about towards the end of this video, and I just moved the tripod around. When it dawned on me that if I rolled the joint away from me, I could film it from across the table. I could try to get this arc shot without having the camera in my armpit. I tacked some square tubing up at an angle, and I think if I have the camera watching from back here, oh, we should both be able to see what's going on. It's technically a different style joint now, but close enough, don't you think? On your screen, this stuff probably looks absolutely gigantic, doesn't it? But for reference, here's a 3.30 second filler up. Anyway, let's see how this camera angle works and how the pulse settings turn out. Not bad, I guess. But for this outside corner joint, that setting seemed a little too hot. The ripples are starting to disappear into each other, which is fine. I think it's still a sound joint, just not exactly what I was going for. So I just watched the video to see if I actually got the shot, and I noticed two things right off the bat. First, I think my torch angle is a little too steep. Second, I might be pulling that bronze out of the shielding gas a little too far. So in theory, what I want to happen is the background current, or the low side of the pulse, I want that to heat up the joint at the lower amp setting, and then get in there with the filler when the hot pulse comes on, to wet it out. Let me try this again. I'm going to drop the welder to 100 amps. The relative pulse setting should be the same since the HTP works on percentages. Let's see what happens. Better, but still a little warm. Let's knock it down five more amps.
Okay, that's it. I've run out of stuff to weld. This is the one you just saw me do at the reduced pulse amperage. So in reverse order, it was this one, this one, and then this one. I think I'm starting to split hairs here. Under the hood, you can sense the small change in amperage, but it's subtle. Something important though that I have been picking up on the more of these beads I run, perhaps this will sound self-evident once I say it out loud, but the bronze filler acts a lot different than steel filler, almost more like aluminum filler. It melts very fast. If you look close in the last weld shot on this piece, at the lower amperage, I was almost force feeding the puddle with the silicon bronze, watching the beads bulge up to about the height I thought looked good before moving on. So I don't know if you can make it out, but this one is a little more crowned and these two are a little flatter. Granted, they were a little hotter, but I was just dabbing on the hot pulse. Here I was more Again, sort of force feeding it on the hot pulse. Probably using, I don't know, not twice as much filler, but 50% more per bead as I was making my way across the joint. Some takeaways. First, brazing with a TIG torch is nothing like brazing with a gas torch. I mean, nothing. I don't even know why they share the same name. A gas braze will wet out the entire joint, if properly prepared, of course. A TIG braze, from what I'm seeing anyway, only wets out where the arc is pointing. Mechanically, a TIG braze joint is very different than a gas braze joint, so keep that in mind. It may sound like it came out of the blue, but I don't know why I had it in my head that the processes would be somewhat similar. Oh, and by the way, do not try to TIG braze using bronze meant for gas brazing. Looks almost identical, I know, but the gas brazing stuff has zinc in it. The TIG brazing rod does not. If you try to TIG with gas rod, you'll foul everything. The joint, the torch, your helmet, your language, everything. Don't ask me how I know. Second, I'm finding it's a very fine line between flowing the bronze nicely and not melting the base metal. So fine, in fact, I think I nipped the base metal in every single one of these. Maybe tungsten prep should be different, perhaps a wider, softer arc, I don't know. As you can tell just by looking, I'll have to spend more time with it. Finally, mind your feed rate with the filler. That's more a note to self kind of thing. I'm gonna have to try to be more consistent with each dab in terms of material I'm leaving behind as I make my way across a joint. No, don't try to adjust your TV. You're seeing that right. A hex brazed to a round. Doesn't get any more dissimilar than that. <laughs>